Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very happy to bring two guests. I'm talking with Moshe Hoffman and Erez Joeli. Moshe is a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology. He's also a research fellow at MIT Sloan School of Management and lecturer at Harvard's Department of Economics. His main interests are on game theory, learning and evolution, and also understanding how we can understand the motives of people to shape our social behaviors. Harris is a research scientist at MIT Sloan School of Management, and director of MIT's Applied Cooperation Team, and lecturer at Harvard's Department of Economics. He um, also looks at uh, social dynamics of people in relationships. He looks at altruism. Uh, he also looks at things such as governments and nonprofits and how we can try to apply lessons of research for uh, kind of very practical uh, pieces in the world. They've written a fabulous book together. Uh, the book is called Hitting Games, The Surprising Power of Game Theory to Explain Irrational Human Behavior. Uh, and that's what we discuss in this conversation. We first start out by talking about what game theory is. We you know, give some definitions and we kind of just lay out the, the, the roadmap for, for game theory, which is what much of the uh, conversation is about. We talk about primary and secondary rewards. We talk about Nash equilibrium and Hawk Dove theory. We talk about the importance of signals and costly signaling model. We talk about signals with different audiences. Talk about evidence and persuasion and how people will spin these. Talk about the prisoner's dilemma. We talk about altruism, cooperation, punishment, and, and many other topics. Um, I was really, you know, excited to talk to both of them. And game theory is not something I really think about or or read and and kind of have my own preconceived ideas about it. It's just this kind of like kind of wonky economic kind of mathematical, you know, theory. Um, but what's so, you know, fabulous about both of these guys is that they, they've written a book that's so well researched, very, very accessible, easy to read, but has a lot of really, really good, uh, rich data. Um, it doesn't feel too pop. Like it's very, um, it's very, very good. It's very well laid out. Their arguments explained, they explain all of the different, um, you know, theories and dilemmas very well. And, and you can hear it in the conversation. I mean, they're both very passionate about this stuff and I really appreciate their, you know, willingness and wanting to say, Hey, how can we take some of this stuff that's, you know, maybe a little bit uh, difficult at times? Um, people aren't reading equations of this stuff on their free time usually. And how can they make it uh, accessible for kind of the, the layperson? And um, it's one of the best books I've read this year. Um, I was so happy to talk to them. And, uh, and so now I bring you Moshe Hoffman and Erez Yuelen. I'm here with Erez Yoeli and Moshe Hoffman. Thank you both for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, super excited to talk to both of you about your wonderful uh, new book. So thank you both. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you guys have written a book called Hidden Games, The Surprising Power of Game Theory to Explain Irrational Human Behavior. Um, I guess the first question I have is how did you guys uh, – you know, decide to write this together. How did that go, and and why this uh, this topic? No, you start. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll lean on you. Okay, um, we have slightly different stories here, actually. So Mo's story, I think, goes back further. He was uh, raised an Orthodox Jew, uh, left the religion because he had encountered some compelling arguments by folks like Richard Dawkins. And there first encountered game theory um, and was totally enamored with it. He, he found it to be uh, very insightful and wondered kind of what else could you learn by digging into game theory and, and kind of made it a, a life ambition of his to do that. Mm. And I remember even in grad school, he was an experimental economist at the time, um, primarily uh, focused on doing uh, uh, I guess, experiments around questions like uh, people's risk aversion levels and things like that. And he, he had not yet 
uh, started doing this. And I remember we had this conversation. He says, but what I really want to do is theory. And I thought to myself, my gosh, that's crazy. Like the theory job market is terrible. Like, what are you doing? You're doing so well in this experimental space. Uh, why would you do that? But he's like, no, no, it's like, that's where, that's where like my real passion lies. And um, years later, he's, he and I are walking together along uh, one of the paths in at UCSD. I was visiting him out there and he's telling me about this game theory class he's teaching. And he's got all these examples in it that I'd never heard of before. And, you know, I'd taken game theory a couple of times. I'd done it in undergrad, I'd done it in grad school. I didn't really like game theory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But here he is, he's telling me about this stuff. And it was fascinating. And I'd never heard it before. And it turns out it's it's uh, the stuff he was talking about is some of the stuff we cover in our book, things like the hawk dove model and mm-hmm. rights, uh, things like costly signaling and our sense of aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Um, and it turns out some of those applications uh, were fairly standard and I just didn't know them. Uh, but regardless, the application of game theory to these questions of where our sense of rights or aesthetics or altruism and so on could come from that was new to me and it really drew me in and, and that's where we really started to talk uh to each other and work together that was probably about 10 years ago hmm. um and then the last bit of the story is uh from that it evolved to us pitching a class to mit at the time hmm. uh, today we teach that class at harvard together and uh we decided that we would teach a class entirely focused around this question we sort of uh i was sort of brought on board to this idea that there's um this gap in the literature where we one could uh use game theory to do a lot more than people had done it and we decided we would try to teach a class on on that and um uh that we've been teaching that together for about eight years and the book grew out of that wow well this is great uh, yeah, yeah. well Eric conveniently left out the part where when i was trying to teach it at ucsd without his help i got like the worst uh student evaluations imaginable everybody was like why well, I, I wanted to take like a standard like game theory class and he's teaching me about like all these like weird applications to like morality <laughs> and politics and like what the hell is he doing and like i'm like e, i don't know how to pull this off and he's like all right, all right i got this <laughs> and uh you know he's got these incredible um He's really, really, as you can tell from the way he's speaking in it, and if you read the book, which uh, he's the primary uh, writer, he, he's just got a very clear voice. And so I guess, you know, we took some of the, the these initial insights, but uh, Eris really turned it into this class at MIT and, and into this mm-hmm. book. And, and I guess, uh, well, it made it made for good teamwork, but yeah, he conveniently left out the part where like, I feel miserably on my own. <laughs> well, it sounds like you guys are a really, really good uh, pair. And um, yeah, the book is is really, really good. I, I've also kind of had a type of allergy to game theory. It's always been this kind of weird kind of space that I'm not really part of. I mean, I do clinical work, so I'm like, ah, I don't know what it is. And, and it really um, kind of just came alive. And so your guys' partnership really is... Uh, is effective because I, I can see a lot of utility. Uh, you kind of mentioned it just real quick. Just uh, tell folks, you know, who you guys are, what you do, and, and where you're at uh, at the moment. Uh, Mo's at um, the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology at the moment, but uh, uh, the two of us uh, have been together uh, mostly in Boston uh, uh, for the last eight years. I'm currently based out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Sloan School of Management. Uh, we're both research scientists uh, and economists by training. Nice, nice. I talked to uh, Patrick Roberts, who's also at Max Planck. He's uh... I think his paleontology um, is, I think, his specialty, so a different department, but um, he also says good things about that institution over there. And so obviously MIT is a pretty good institution as well. So uh, you guys are you guys are doing really, really good stuff. OK, so let's just dive into the main piece of it here. So what is game theory um, and how can that mathematical toolkit uh, help us figure things out uh, and figure people out and things in the world? So either one of you can can uh, take that. No, you or me. Uh, do you mind starting? All right. Um, I guess at, at its core, games are really, really simple. They're they're they've got three parts. There there's some players. They've got some actions they can take. They've got to get some payoffs. Hmm. The the thing that makes game theory game theory. There's kind of two things. Number one is that those payoffs they depend not just on what one particular player does, but what on all, what the other players are going to do as well. Um, and then the other thing that that makes it uh, game theory is that there's an assumption, and I guess this is just part of being an economist uh, and being a field of economics, is there's an assumption that people are making those decisions uh, between those different actions in some sort of optimal fashion. Um, so that that fundamentally is all that's going on. It's it's a math toolkit, as you just described, designed to 
analyze social interactions where where what I do depends what's optimal for me to do to do depends on what uh, what other people are doing. And it traditionally developed for things like um, how should firms compete with one another or how should countries interact with one another or you know if I'm going to design an auction, how should I do that? And if I change the rules, what will happen to revenues or um, another a famous application of game theory was to things like card games. I think that's where the, mm. the name actually comes from. It's from parlor, parlor games. Mm. Um, and, and in the original books on uh, introducing game theory, they, they featured heavily. Um, so what we've done is, is actually changed the focus a bit uh, and, and focus on cases where people maybe aren't making their decisions as consciously and deliberately. And instead, uh, we're using it to understand where people's intuitions and beliefs and tastes come from. Uh, but but uh, other than that, it's it's game theory like it's always been. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe just to add to that, um, uh, Zaviar, um, uh, um, like you might wonder why game theory would apply to these um, questions of like weird aspects of our beliefs and preferences, which is the domain that we're focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that that's, that's a lot of what the main contribution of, of this book and our class was, is we, we spent, I guess, the first few chapters kind of setting that up and laying the stage for that and really kind of laying out those foundations. And the, the key argument that we present there is uh, one, uh, Yes, people being like uber rational and and optimizing through their conscious choices, one way to justify the logic of game theory, but not the only way. And, and I guess maybe many people in your audience, yourself included, would be aware of, of a second way, um, which is uh, biological evolution. So, you know, animals might evolve to behave optimally and that could get them to correspond with what um, the game theoretic model would predict, even if they're not consciously, strategically, you know, rational. And I, I guess the other possible foundation and, and the one that we tend to rely on the most and, and really devoted, you know, a whole chapter or two to lay out is the idea of uh, learning processes, including social learning and learning from others. And there's a lot of good evidence that, that a lot of our beliefs and our tastes are developed from trial and error or from uh, uh, social learning. Um, and um, so we rely heavily on, you know, the cultural evolutionary literature, people like uh, Joe Henrik and Rob Boyd, they, they've both written some really good books on that. And we, we kind of summarize that literature a little bit, but, but we, we very heavily rely on those foundations to, to argue that game theory can apply to this kind of new domain once you incorporate the logic of um, learning and, and uh, cultural evolution. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's the most curious thing about the book. And that's the thing that I think makes it the most powerful and unique is some people will be familiar with game theory. And some people obviously will be familiar with evolutionary biology or cultural evolution. But the fact that you're merging the two worlds not in a type of way in which it's um, trying to, to, to make it fit. It's more of how do you have uh, basically a different uh, structure or framing to understand things we already know about is what I think makes it so powerful. You mentioned the, the, the learning piece. Um, you don't have to go over it all completely, but I guess just, you know, you talk a little bit about um, <laughs> behaviorism, right? Reinforcement learning, uh, learning through imitation, um, et cetera. How, how is uh, various forms of learning uh, leading us to do what's good for us from this structure that you guys are kind of uh, giving? So fundamentally, what you need here is for things that are succeeding to become more common. And, and that's it. Like, there are, and there are various ways that humans do that. We can learn from our own experience. We walk outside, somebody gives us a, uh, a compliment on what we're wearing, you know, oh, well, you know, this, that kind of worked. Let me wear that again. Um, and you wear something and nobody says anything, or, you know, maybe even a friend whispers to you, hey, that looks kind of baggy on you. <laughs> then maybe you're less likely to wear it. So that's one way we can do it. That's called reinforcement learning. Another way might be something like uh, I see George Clooney wearing something. I think, <laughs> oh, like, if he's wearing it, maybe it makes sense for me to go wear it. I, I go by a Rolex watch too. Uh, so now we're learning uh, by imitation, but we're not just imitating anybody, right? I, mm -hmm. I don't go and buy uh, a watch from somebody who I think is, is kind of a loser. Uh, I go buy some a watch that somebody wears that I admire. Um, and so again, what, what we're seeing is that stuff that is is a little bit more likely to succeed is is more likely to be imitated, more likely to be adopted. That that uh, is is the key critical piece here. And 
and mm. basically is is how learning leads to stuff eventually kind of being optimized over time. Mm. And you gave a little bit of, I only bring this up because you bring mentioned it in the book, you talk about these different primary and secondary rewards, which again, is a kind of fundamental thing of uh, behaviorism. Um, you also talk about emic and etic, you don't have to get into that too much. But I guess, what are the differences between these primary and secondary rewards? And why are they important for understanding uh, the, the game theory? So the, the distinction comes from the animal training literature, mm -hmm. I think, or maybe it's talked about it in uh, more broadly than just that, but like one place where the average listener might have encountered it is there. Uh, if you're training a dog to, to do stuff, uh, you typically do it using things like a snack. Um, you give the dog a snack when they do the thing you want, and uh, they're more likely to do it again. Mm -hmm. Things like snacks are primary rewards. There's something that uh, the dog evolved to like, all dogs kind of like them. You don't really have to worry about there being a uh, uh, variation in whether dogs like them or not. You can kind of rely on it. Um, some other examples of things like primary rewards might be things like uh, access to uh, romantic partners or, or mates. Uh, it might be things like uh, safety, comfort, um, uh power, prestige for humans, things like that. So some things that like basically everybody uh, will uh, like more of, uh, and they're also the things that tend to shape other things we tend to learn to like. So something like, you know, my, my brother's dog, you might have seen her uh, come by here. She wanted to get, get a drink earlier. She also likes doing things like playing with me by giving me her paw, uh, doing little uh, uh, tricks where she she turns around, where she she lies down, things like that. She finds it fun, her tail is wagging and so on. But she didn't evolve to like those things. She learned to like them, presumably through association with praise and those snacks that we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. So those are things uh, that we would call secondary rewards. They're things that people learn to like in and of themselves, but they learn to like them uh, via the, their association with uh, primary rewards. Uh, you an example of a secondary reward in, in uh, humans? Yeah. So um, money, correct, you, is a secondary reward. Is this correct or that's no? A, that's a classic one. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it becomes associated with resources, with uh, uh, things like having a roof over your head, with yeah. access to uh, uh, romantic partners, and you end up liking it in and of itself. That would be a classic one. But it could be things like I go to the museum and I, I look at Guernica and it's like unbelievably cool. And I get mm -hmm. like my mind blown. Mm -hmm. That's a secondary reward, too. Obviously, like, we didn't evolve to like these sketches that Picasso put on large canvases. That, that's clearly not, not something that, that is a primary reward embedded in all humans, but we do legitimately love it. So that would be another. Especially Garnica, I guess you picked that on purpose. Like some art might be like inherently pleasing, like if it's of a landscape or if like a curvy woman or something like that. But uh, Garnica is like, you know, a pretty grotesque image of like something that like normally we would want to avoid. Um, and yet, you know, we learn to associate it with uh, uh, something like, beauty or, 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 or high art or I, I don't know what, but th that's a learned association. And so, so the, the feeling of pleasure that you might get from looking at that had to be learned. And that, that's why we would call it secondary. But he, he mentioned, you know, earlier, like the fashion of um, George Clooney, like, you know, we didn't evolve to like, you know, whatever sunglasses he's wearing, like that, they clearly like the fact that like you think they're cool. Uh, and, and like now you might get reward, you might get like some kind of internal pleasure from wearing or seeing those sunglasses isn't isn't a, a primary reward that's that's secondary in that you only like it because of its association with, you know, status, namely George Clooney. Um, and, and so. Uh, you know, in the in the book, sorry, sorry if I cut you off, Harris, but um, uh, in, in the book, you know, we 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 think it's we talk a lot about this distinction between primary and secondary, and the the reason is because a lot of things in humans that we puzzle over are things that that are secondary rewards. So we wonder, you know, why are people some people really passionate about chess and others about like go or like helping the environment? Why are you know why do we have various different principles where you know some people might devote 
um, their lives to like helping democracy and others uh, really care about honesty and uh, um, others aren't all that principled at all. And, you know, the, these are kind of things that are, are in some sense secondary, like they're not innate, they're not universal, they're, they, they vary a lot and they seem to be kind of learned. And so, um, you know, that's part of the puzzle is where, where do these things come from? And we think it's important to distinguish between the things we, we like and care about um, that's innate and evolved and, and universal versus those things that I just listed, which are the puzzles that the book is like meant to talk about. In order to understand those secondary rewards, you need to first think about the primary rewards, the underlying evolved things that we like that, that might have shaped those secondary things. So what, what kind of... What kind of things would having passions or principles lead you to? Why would we, you know, learn to like Garnica, Garnica or I can't pronounce it, or, you know, the sunglasses, um, a, a specific type of fashion? And so, you know, it, it's kind of crucial to separate out the things that, that we start off liking from the, the things that are puzzling that, that, that we now see people liking. And, you know, we, one big confusion that we often see in the literature, especially among, you know, uh, economists, which are the people that we grew up around, is you know, people just kind of treat all of the things that we like as like, you know, in our utility function. And I don't know, people just have their preferences. And like, you know, if you want to understand the weird things people do, like economists just say, well, they have preferences and here's what those preferences look like. And, you know, our point is that's kind of silly. Like some of those preferences are secondary rewards and you can explain them by thinking about the primary rewards. And so the primary rewards have a lot of explanatory power, but only once you kind of clearly define them and delineate them from the, the learned secondary stuff. And, and so, so that differentiation is crucial. And, and game theory can really help when it's applied at the level of the primary rewards if you want to explain things at the level of, uh, uh, that are that are secondary. That's kind of the, the, the main thesis. And chapter three kind of tries to lay out that argument. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's really important and really helpful because yeah, I mean in in uh, in psychology we, we we learn about this stuff in terms from a behaviorist mindset. So we learn about it in rats and dogs and cats, but we learn about it also in how you can, let I me mean, legitimately train uh, children. Uh, you can train uh, certain uh, individuals that need certain behavioral modifications. So this comes into play with humans as well, as you guys are also noting. Um, I want to jump to. Nash equilibrium, because that's a huge thing in the book, and to explain it, uh, and then um, we can talk about the hawk dove game, which you guys mentioned earlier. So, what is Nash equilibrium? Uh, I mean, obviously, some people may have seen the film A Beautiful Mind, um, which is a depiction of John Nash, who was a famous uh, mathematician, um, and he create. He's I think that's named after him. Um, so, what what is this, and why is it uh, all important? Yeah, if you want to learn what a Nash equilibrium is, don't watch that movie. Yeah, it will uh, <laughs> yes, almost don't, certainly don't watch the movie. <laughs> they they actually kind of get it backwards. It's uh, it's a little frustrating. I'll I'll explain why in a second. But uh, <laughs> first, what is it? So so uh, you guys got what a game was. You got those players with the actions and the payoffs. Mm -hmm. A Nash equilibrium is just a, a set of actions such that no player can benefit by unilaterally de unilaterally deviating. Meaning I can't do any better given what everybody else is doing, taken that as given. That's all it is. So um, you mind just um, maybe walking through something like the hawk dub game and what, what uh, using that definition of Nash equilibrium in that game, maybe to make it a little bit more concrete. As, as a type of analogy of sorts? Or an example, rather? As an example, example. yeah. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the Hawk Dove game uh, is uh, a game with two players, mm -hmm. each of which has the following two actions they can choose from, Hawk or Dove. Those are intended to represent um, either being aggressive over a resource or acquiescing. Mm -hmm. uh, Hawk is obviously the aggressive one. The Dove is, is acquiescing over it. There's a, there's a, in order to understand the payoffs of this game, it's, it's helpful to continue to think about this resource and, and what might happen. So if there is, uh, um, if both players are playing Hawk, then uh, there's, they're basically fighting over this resource. There's some chance each will win, but they also have to pay the cost of the fight. So that's, Sorry, um, go ahead. Not, not sure if you mentioned this, but just to make, make the context clear, the Hawk Dove game is like kind of one of the simplest game theory models. And it's usually used to model a case where like, two animals or, or that's the original uh, the original instantiation two animals are fighting over a contested resource like, like a, a piece of land or a piece of meat or something like that so i may, maybe you said that but 
I think in most uh, contexts in which I've heard it is usually within nowadays with humans between uh, two nation states trying to fight over a piece of land or, oh, yeah. you know, you're, you know, that's usually people call someone as hawkish or dovish on war. Uh, that's usually yeah. how I've heard it as, as yeah, well. That's it. But anyhow, I'm sorry. I uh, no, that helpful, helpful. And um, so you've got uh, you've got the two players. That they've got those those choices. And now now keeping in mind that there is this contest. OK, if both players play Hawk. Um, then there's some chance each will get this resource, but they also have to pay the cost of fighting. Um, and so we would say, okay, here's the, there's some value to this resource, which we might uh, assign um, a parameter V. Uh, there's only a half chance, let's say, that each gets it. So it's they, they get each get V over two, but have to pay some cost C. So their total payoff is V over two minus C. That's a very it's simple way of off. putting it. That's right. And then if, if one plays Hawk, but the other plays Dev, the player who plays Hawk gets the resource, there's no fight. Um, and so the player who plays Hawk gets V, the other player gets zero. And then the last thing we have to worry about is uh, bo both players playing Dove. In this case, again, it's not clear who's going to get the resource, maybe 50-50 chance, uh, but they don't at least have to pay the cost of fighting, and so their payoff would be V over 2. Hmm. So that's your characterization of this game. The Nash equilibrium... So notice, game, just notice, in that simple game, Eros had players. There's, there's two players who... And each has, you know, two possible actions. They could play Hawk or Dove. And then he just kind of told you all the all the possible payoff combinations. You know, V over 2 minus C, V over 2, V. Okay. So uh, anyhow, that, I'm just trying to map it back onto Erez's er er earlier characterization of what counts as a game. So this is this is a classic, simple game. Hmm. Hmm. And then you, you, you ask, okay, what are the Nash equilibria of this game? So we're looking for the uh, action pairs, the, the, the sets of actions such that no player can benefit by unilaterally deviating. So let's start at the beginning. Let's say, okay, what about that, that uh, pair of actions where both players are playing Hawk? Is that uh, a case uh, where neither player can benefit by deviating? And the answer is, if the cost of fighting is high enough, remember that payoff was V over 2 minus C. So that if that C is high enough, mm -hmm. then V over 2 minus C is going to actually be negative. Hmm. And so a player could actually benefit by deviating by just saying, screw this, I don't want to fight. I'm going to walk away mm -hmm. and, uh, and play, play dub. And each player could do that. So that's not a national equilibrium. Holding constant what the other guy's doing. The other guy's playing Hawk. I can benefit by deviating to dub. Hmm. What about uh, at the very end, the, the one where both players are playing dub? Well, now you can sort of pretty quickly see, actually, I can benefit by deviating. If the other guy's playing dub, I'm better off playing Hawk. Where you get stuck. You get the actually, item and no fight. You get V over two instead of, uh, you, you get V instead of V over two. Hmm. Exactly. And then where you get stuck at a Nash equilibrium uh, and stuck is sort of um, uh, the sense in which you, it's uh, uh, self-reinforcing is if I'm playing Hawk and you're playing Dove or vice versa, because now if I'm playing Hawk and you're playing Dove, if I go ahead and switch to playing Dove, I'm not going to do any better off. I'm going to go from V to V over two. And uh, at the same time, you can't do any better off either. While you're getting zero now, if you switch to, to playing Hawk, you're going to uh, have to fight and you're going to go to from, from zero to V over two minus C, which if C is big enough, it is, is less than zero. So Sorry. this game has two Nash equilibria, Hawk Dove and Dove Hawk. So, but uh, Xavier, let me just jump in and kind of uh, make a meta comment, which is, um, you know, this this game, it was fairly simple to lay out. You know, errors, all, all errors assumed was like, you can either behave aggressively or not. There's some item you're fighting over and there's some kind of cost of fighting and value of the, the object. That, that was like the whole setting. And errors said, okay, how would we analyze that? Well, there's a simple tool, Nash Equilibria. And like, if you just stop and think about it, it's really, without that tool, it's really not at all obvious how to think about this setting. And what Nash Equilibria tells you is, look, there's actually, uh, there, there's actually something really interesting that can come out of this setting, which is like, you'll always have one individual who behaves aggressively and one who, be, who behaves uh, submissively. And it totally is arbitrary, which is which, but you won't have one where they both behave aggressively or where they both behave submissively, which, you know, maybe those would seem more fair or more egalitarian, but that, those actually aren't equilibria and like that's not what a game theorist would predict what a game theorist would predict is you get this very even though the, the setting is very symmetric you get a very asymmetric outcome and that the outcome totally depends on like who's just expected to, to play which way and it, that's like totally self-fulfilling and so that's that's like kind of kind of cool like there's no there's no way that you would know how to analyze this game without nash and with nash you get this like totally counterintuitive insight which is that our, our, 
arbitrary differences between the players, so long as each player expects, you know, has some sense of who's going to behave aggressively, that becomes self-fulfilling. And that, that gets used to explain things like animal territoriality. So the idea is like the animal that arrives at a, a, a patch of land first, even if that doesn't help him fight, it can set expectations that he's going to behave aggressively, that ends up being self-fulfilling. That's why animals are territorial. And, and it could say something about, you know, um, nation states, like you were saying before, maybe one nation is going to behave aggressively. If, if, if everybody expects him to, other nations are, are going to, you know, end up uh, uh, submitting because they, they don't want to risk a fight. And that could also explain things like why nations might defend certain, certain borders or certain rights over others. And, you know, we end up talking for a lot in that chapter on like the, the whole idea of like rights and like property rights, where did they come from? This simple game could help explain, explain that. And like the, the core insight is just coming from this idea about Nash equilibrium, which hopefully that example helped to illustrate. Yeah, I think I got it. I guess the question I have here is, is, is on, on, on two, I have two sub questions here. The first question is, the aim or or the goal here in in any type of of uh, game or comp, there there has to be not necessarily a winner, but there's something that's trying to be uh, done, right? People are trying to gain something, right? There you have these two players. There is some type of conflict, or maybe not, and there will be cost to how they interact. But they're trying to get something. Right. That that's that's the whole point of doing that. Right. Is they don't do it aimlessly. They're not doing it just for shits and grins. They're trying to have some type, whether it's dominance, whether it's right land or it's, a, you know, some piece of uh, uh, if it's with animals, some some uh, food. That's what makes this important. Right. Is that there is a certain type of achieved goal or, or some type of agreed upon aim where it's like we both want this piece of land or we both want this meal or we both want something that we don't have so we'll either fight about it or we'll acquiesce and maybe get something else out of it that there's a kind of uh implicit goal or aim in, in why people would play this game is 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 that am i getting this wrong or is that that's about right yeah, I mean, I, I think what I would say is like, there's always got to be some notion of payoffs, which corresponds to some notion of like costs and benefits. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, we always uh, talk about those payoffs in terms of, as we discussed earlier, this notion of primary rewards. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the primary reward in this case could be something like, you know, having access to food or, or, or a, piece of, a piece of land, a piece of territory or, or, or a, a mate. These kind of things, those are primary. And like when the interaction has the properties that, well, there's only one of these resources available and multiple individuals might want it. Like that, that's going to be exactly a setting where the hot dog model is going to help. But there could be other social settings where like the payoffs works differently, in which case the hot dog model isn't going to, isn't going to be a great model for it. And, you know, for instance, we talk a lot about coordination settings where like, actually what you want to do is you want, like you get your highest payoff when you do the same thing as other uh, uh, individuals. And so, you know, for instance, if um, uh, when we're enforcing norms, a key aspect of enforcing norms is like you want to kind of only sanction people when others are going to agree with you. And so there's kind of there, there's a coordination component to, to norm enforcement. And that's very different from like what we were talking about with the hot dog game. And so there's still a logic of we can apply game theory to understand kind of the social payoffs. But you have to you have to think a little bit. There's a little bit of an odd to, well, what's the key social payoffs in this setting? Well, for norms, uh, you know, the a key aspect of it is going to be that there's a motive to, to do what others are going to do and to coordinate. Whereas when you're fighting over a, a scarce resource, it's going to look more like the hopped up game. Mm. I'm going to resist the urge to try and, and have any example of either current conflicts or, or <laughs> controversial conflicts as an example, because uh, I don't want to get people angry. But, you know, obviously, I think listeners could probably look at past conflicts, whether it's I don't know, the Civil War here in the United States or whether it's Vietnam or, you know, take your take your conflict in terms of You're uh, choose war. the Civil War as a conflict that won't get people angry. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just saying, like, you know, there, there's all these things, right, that could make people super upset. Uh, I won't ask you guys to do that i don't want to get you guys in hot water but obviously it's interesting how these have been applied at a grand scale but then they're also applied at a at a, in a, in a personal scale as well which leads to i guess the next point which is about signals uh you guys talk in the middle of the book about signals status um you, you mentioned the uh costly signal model so where do you, you were kind of alluding to it what is the value and importance i guess i should say 
of signals. Why do we use this? Why do we look for this? Is it just a heuristic that we're using that can be, you know, not so good or maybe sometimes good? What's the utility of um, uh, of signals here? Ooh, lots of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Mo, you want to start or should I? Uh, please, please. All right. Um, I guess maybe like the way I would start is to say there's a lot of settings where we might want to know something important about somebody. There might be some uh, attribute uh, that they have that we want to know about. The classic example is how much money does this person have? But this is just one of many examples. We might want to know something about their character. We might want to know something about uh, what they care about. Uh, we might want to know something about their upbringing or their social network or something like this. And these are things that, while they're very important to us, we can't easily observe them when we first interact with somebody. I, I can't see, you know, they're not wearing a shirt with a ticker uh, with their net worth. They're not uh, gonna wear a shirt with a ticker with all like, you know, here's my social network, here's a map of it, and here are all the important people I know, uh, you know, things like that. So, so these things are not directly observable. And there might be uh, some things though that somebody could do to uh, some signals that somebody could send that might tell us something about that underlying uh, characteristic. The very, very classic example of this is uh, the peacock and, uh, and the peacock's tail. Mm -hmm. Some peacocks are healthier and fitter than other peacocks. Um, a peahen is more interested in mating with a fitter peacock, but she can't see the peacock's genes directly. Mm -hmm. um, she can't tell which uh, peacock just necessarily is, has better genes or which, uh, which ones doesn't, but what she can see is uh, the length of the peacock's tail. So uh, peacocks send a signal. Um, and the important part here is that that signal has some cost, hence the costly signaling mm -hmm. piece. Um, and if that, um, cost is such that it's hard for not fit peacocks to send it, but possible for the fit peacocks to send it, it can be an equilibrium for the peahen to expect that signal and only want to mate with peacocks that have it, for the fit peacocks to send it, and for the not uh, fit ones uh, not to send it. That same idea, we can use that in these other contexts. Let me, uh, let me just jump in before you before you mention it. So, so he is describing the cost of signal model, which is one type of signal that you can get uh, in some settings. And what's, what's uh, just to kind of draw out the, the key features that it has that Eris alluded to is one is like you're sending a signal about some underlying desirable trait that might otherwise be hard to observe. And the signal is itself costly. It's itself wasteful. And, and, and that's why it's kind of like puzzling when you look at it. So, so you know, why peacocks have long tails, uh, maybe Eris didn't emphasize it uh, uh, so much, but like they're actually, they make the peacock worse at flying and like more easier to, to get caught by predators. And like for, mm -hmm. from an evolutionary perspective, that's quite puzzling. And so, so this specific type of signal is, is one that's, that's actually inherently like somewhat paradoxical. Um, and what Ares is, it, 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 it was, was walking through and it's going to continue to walk through is like this paradox actually gets resolved in equilibrium because, well, it's just Nash, no, no individual peacock or pecan could benefit from deviating once you kind of specify that the more fit ones pay this cost and the less fit ones don't, and the peahens only mate with the ones that do pay this cost. That ends up being self-sustaining in a way that actually leads to these kind of like wasteful, weird tails. And, and so, so that's, that's. Uh, again, the cool logic of game theory, giving you something kind of intuitive, explaining something that's otherwise puzzling. And sorry, I just wanted to, to jump in with that. Eris is going to now give some examples in humans, and then maybe afterwards we'll talk about other types of signals, with, which mm -hmm. the book has a few other chapters after the costly mm -hmm. signaling one. Mm -hmm. So some other examples of uh, costly signals that we discussed in the book are things like uh, people uh, in, across many different agrarian cultures from uh, rural Egypt all the way through rural China uh, will develop a liking for long fingernails, especially on men, mm -hmm. and they're often long pinky nails. Mm -hmm. um, and so one could ask, what, you know, what could that possibly signal? When you ask people themselves who are growing these nails, they'll tell you, oh, I don't know, they're just beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you ask more questions, eventually you'll discover that the only people who, who grow these things are folks with desk jobs, not folks who are farmers. And it seems like what's going on is that this fingernail is a signal of somebody's profession. Here you have that, that underlying trait that might be desirable. What kind of job do you have? 
if you have one that's a higher status desk job and uh, somebody being able, somebody might want to know about it and you can't necessarily tell them about it so clearly, but you can grow a long finger, fingernail. So there's, there's an, an example. Another example might be something like skin tone across history and across different cultures. Um, it's been common for people to prefer uh, lighter shades uh, uh, of skin tone. Today, uh, in our culture, we happen to like tan skin. Um, so the preference is somewhat reversed. Um, and so what could, among, among Caucasians, uh, we're not talking about like uh, racial preferences or anything like this. Mm -hmm. Among Caucasians, we, we have a preference for, for, for those who are more tanned in, in our culture. That's right. Um, uh, you thanks for speaking of hot water. I can easily find myself hot. Yeah. And um, and so the uh, uh, the question might be like, why would that preference arise? Why would you have one preference one sometime and another preference another? Like, time? Just, again, to, just to again clarify, like I, I think maybe you mentioned this, but but maybe I'll just draw it out to make the puzzle more clear. Which is, you know, a hundred years ago, we per like white people used to like especially carry around umbrellas to like prevent themselves from, mm -hmm. from getting tan skin. And we do the opposite. We go to beaches and like slather ourselves with like tanning lotion. Exactly. So like, you know, again, this is like quote, a secondary uh, um, uh, preference that we've developed mm -hmm. like for either tan skin or it used to be for pale skin. And like, you could ask, where is this coming from? And I, I guess Ares is about to, to give that logic, which, which should be not too surprising for anybody who, who's seen the cost signaling model. Yeah, it also should be surprising if you, you've just listened to the fingernails example, which is uh, if you're working in the fields all day, it's awfully hard to be uh, pale skinned. Mm -hmm. You become tan mm -hmm. real fast. Mm -hmm. And so if there's some prestige to, to indoor jobs, um, if that's a trait that one would want others which to do about. Which would have been true before, uh, before the Industrial Revolution when everybody was kind of working agricultural jobs and, and yeah, in some parts of the world where agricultural jobs are still kind of the norm. Mm -hmm. Then in those cases, uh, one might want uh, one might develop a preference for uh, the lighter skin, and then it might flip if, in fact, what uh, everybody's got an indoor job, and uh, what you want to do is show that you can afford to go lie on a beach in Florida. <laughs> the, the thing is, all of these things. Sorry, go no. That's okay. <laughs> The, to answer the original question, which is what is signaling, what you can see here is that is that what these uh, preferences are are doing is they're uh, allowing there's there's something observable that's allowing us to uncover a desirable trait, and and they typically have some cost associated with them. That cost in, in equilibrium has to be the case that that cost is correlated with that desirable trait. The folks with the desirable trait have an easier time sending the signal. When that's the case. Uh, these signals can arise. And the fun part is trying to figure out if you see some one of these signals, you're like, oh, okay, but what is that signal? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and how do you, oh, sorry. You know, I was just going to say how the, 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 how this comes into uh, how, how people are signaling in a social context and how they're s signaling in a social context at scale. Right. So a signal that I might give if I'm in, you know, a small group of people might be different than in a larger group of people. Right. Or, um, you know, if there's a, a signal you give for a potential mate, that's going to be a different signal uh, or context uh, than, you know, with a group of 100 people. So it, I wonder what is it look how do signals look different? Uh, respective for the different type of relationship and or how they look when it's at uh, a very large scale as well, right? So people, people in my family one to one might not really care how much money I make, but that might be a little bit more of a statement if um, I'm presenting at a conference and I come with a four thousand dollar suit, right? My uncle might not give a shit about that. It's a signal, but he might not care. But it might be something different if it's with a larger group of people or where I'm looking to have some type of attributions from other people, things like that. So I just wonder how do signals look in different contexts and with different types of relationships? Yeah. So I, I think uh, people are quite, uh, I mean, there's a reason why we're not the first to talk about costly signaling. It's like, uh, you know, it's a very well studied phenomenon. And I think that's largely because people are just so insanely good at it and we spend so much resources and effort at it. And one of the things that people are good at is unlike the peacocks, which just grow this tail and it's the same thing they have their whole lives. We really calibrate to our audience and we really develop totally different signals in totally different contexts. 
and uh, emphasize different signals. And it, we're, we're quite clever at this. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I think that that's absolutely right. We want to signal different things to different people, which creates, interestingly, some other kind of meta signaling dynamics. So, so let me give a few examples of that. So one is, I don't know, people talk about you know, tattoos, what are those signaling? Um, and, uh, you know, one, one thing, exactly, one thing in particular about tattoos is you can't actually alter the signal depending on your audience. I mean, maybe to some extent you can cover it up, but especially ones that are on your neck or like, like, like on your wrist or something, the hard to hide. And in fact, that's part of the point is what you're saying is, no, I'm making sure every audience can see this. It's, mm-hmm. it's not the kind of signal like my speech acts which I could speak differently to different audiences, my tattoos are there. Mm-hmm. And so I'm signaling to you that I am showing this to everybody and that everybody can now see me, including conservative people who hate tattoos. And I'm willing to risk my relationships with them. I'm willing to you know, risk not having certain jobs. Maybe this is more true in the past than you know, nowadays, maybe people care less about it. But, um, but uh, you know, this, this is, it's an example of, you know, people talk about some signals burn bridges and and what you're signaling is the fact that you're kind of have this have this irreversible signal it it, it suggests well you're really committed to like the inside group that cares about these signals so Mm. much so that you're willing to burn bridges with the outside groups that don't like it Mm. you know another example of this is um Mm. uh, um uh i i uh, uh maybe it's only somewhat uh, observable, but things like circumcision, where you have this kind of, um, you know, it's built to show other Jewish people, at, at least originally it was Jews, um, that like, okay, I'm part of the tribe. And part of what I did is it made sure that if you ever, you know, tried to sleep with somebody outside of the tribe or, or marry outside of the tribe, they'd be able to tell, oh, this is this person's, uh, you know, from from this other tribe, they're an outsider. And you're you're cutting off you're cutting off those options when you circumcise in a way that's irreversible. Like you can't just uncircumcise yourself. Um, and so, so that, that the fact that it's irreversible, the fact that you're cutting off outside options is itself sending a signal that you care less about those outside options and more about this in group. Um, and uh, you care enough about the in group. You're committed enough to the in group that you're willing to burn those bridges. Um, and in fact, another kind of meta point that, that's related here is we have a whole chapter on, on modesty. Mm-hmm. And we make the point that that oftentimes what we're doing with when we're acting modest or, you know, when we do good deeds and like, uh, like, don't don't brag about it, like, um, you know, let, uh, give to charity and do it anonymously and stuff like that. It's not that you're not sending any signal when you do that. It's that you're sending a signal that only some people are going to find out about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and by doing that, again, it's kind of a meta signal in the sense that, like, you're willing to avoid certain people observing it. And, and in so doing that, you're sending the signal that you care less about those people. You're not just putting, you're not giving money to the this um, art museum because you want everybody who goes there to like recognize your name. And that suggests to me something different about, if I do learn that you donated money to the art museum, it suggests to me something about your motives. It's not just to become popular or famous. Um, it's maybe because you care more about art or you care more about like the select group of people that might find out that you gave. Um, so yeah, the fact that that we uh, the way that we tailor to audiences also or can and cannot tailor to audiences also can 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 create in itself a, a, a new interesting meta signal, um, and that that's something we talk about. Yeah, the the buried signals, the modesty, anonymous giving, all these things are was super fascinating when I read that because it's like, oh yeah, those things do happen, but it does seem like it is for a particular in group. Uh, much in the same way as I think maybe, uh, maybe not quite the same, but there are certain signals that people send when they're part of a, of a particular group where, you know, like, um, you know, people that, uh, listen to certain types of music and there's a kind of, uh, unspoken dress code. If you're, you know, into punk and hardcore or you're, you're into the goth scene or something, there's a certain physical appearance or how you do makeup or things like that, where you're wanting to say, I'm one of these, one of these guys or one of these girls or one of these people. Um, and you know, it doesn't, I don't care if I get looks from, you know, everyone else on the street, I'm going to this show and I'm hanging out with all my, my people and we're having a good time and whatever. Sometimes it seems as if the, the, it's a strange thing, either the permanency of it or, or how we're sending certain signals for one particular group is somewhat bigger uh, than with maybe a, a larger group, which is really, really, really fascinating how people, um, you know, that kind of goes into decision making, but how they make those decisions to say this is more salient for me to, 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 to signal here. 
Um, I, I want to talk about uh, evidence and, uh, and persuasion. You guys talk about three ways people spin evidence. Um, so this is obviously something we've seen a lot more of recently, unfortunately. You talk about biased revelation, biased search, and con confirmatory testing. Just talk about, I guess, the ways in which people spin evidence um, and how persuasion is involved with, with game theory and to explain evidence that's uh, been spun. You, you, let me just start, start off with like one very brief comment that, that I'll let you take it off if you don't mind. Um, uh, just to connect it to our earlier discussion about signaling. Um, like, as I mentioned, costly signaling is kind of like the preeminent form of signaling that a lot of people have talked about. And just to kind of emphasize before jumping into evidence, um, uh, what we try to do in the chapters on costly signaling and modesty that you've already alluded to is talk a little bit about like what are the key features of costly signals? How do you how do you provide evidence that costly signaling is going on? You you as a scientist or, or, or an outside observer, how, how would you figure out what's being signaled? And then some of these like kind of uh, um, more complicated forms of signals like like buried signals, as you mentioned. Uh, you know how do those look different from some more standard costly signals? So that's what we try to do in those two chapters. But another type of signaling that we then talk about next is evidence, which you just asked us about. And the thing that makes evidence different from other types of signals, I just want to kind of emphasize that, is evidence doesn't have a cost. It's just kind of free to present. Um, you know, I can just share with you my SAT scores or, or my bank statement. You know, it doesn't cost me anything to do that. Um, it's not like growing a long tail or buying a Rolex watch. It's freely transmitted, um, but it can't be faked. Um, so I can't, you know, it's assumed that like, maybe I could, um, uh, fabricate a bank statement, but maybe that's, that's really hard. Or if I get caught doing that, I get so much in trouble that like, you know, let's just, you know, for simplicity, imagine that you can't, you can't make up evidence. Mm -hmm. What you can do is withhold evidence. So I could choose to say, no, I'm not sharing my bank statement with you. Like it's none of your business. Mm -hmm. Um, or, oh, I'm sorry. I lost it. Uh, you know, I, I can't, can't seem to locate that piece of evidence, but, but I assure you it's good. And so, so that's what makes evidence unique is it's freely transmissible. You can't fabricate it but you can withhold it. And so then the question is, what can we explain with this type of signal, a signal with those, those three properties? And um, you know, how will that help us understand things like, like the way that we spin or the way that we persuade um, and our own biased beliefs? And I, I guess hopefully that's, that's where Eris is gonna jump in. Yeah, why don't I, I give a little more detail on the kinds of spin that we discuss sure. in the book and then uh, maybe we'll, we'll come back to sort of the, the core of the explanation mm -hmm. for it. Um, so you, you mentioned the three. Uh, I'll start with biased revelation. Uh, the idea here is why do we tend to only present the stuff that's uh, supportive or good for us and uh, hide the stuff that, that's not uh, so not so flattering? So just think about social media here. I mean, it's, it's really obvious there. You, you hop on Instagram or whatever, and everybody's putting their best foot forward. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're having a good time in their life, a bad time in their life, they have beautiful photos up. Yeah. Um, so they're clearly just presenting the good stuff. It's not like I'm going to put my burnt dinners and my bald spots and, you know, my messy rooms and things like that on Instagram. I'm going to make everything look as good as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's an example of that. Another example of this is if you uh, um, turn on uh, Fox News or CNN and there's some sort of scandal going on for one of the sides, then the side that is getting hammered at the moment, the the opposite side is going to be talking about it all the time. They're going to be like, yeah, look at those guys. They suck. Mm -hmm. And the other side is going to be like covering, you know, a new form of ant was discovered in the Amazon <laughs> today. Uh, and they will be completely silent on, on the, the scandal. And, and right. you can actually see this in various ways. An interesting way to do this is to look at word counts. Mm -hmm. So you can look at, say, in the 2016 election, how many times did Fox News say the word Russia versus mm -hmm. CNN? Mm -hmm. you know, Trump Trump had this this scandal. Uh, you know, was Fox News covering the scandal? The answer is about a third as often. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, an example of bias revelation there. We see it everywhere. I mean, when you introduce a friend, you don't mm -hmm. introduce them by saying, hi, this is my friend Jack. He's really smart. He also never washes his hands after he pees, so don't shake them. Mm -hmm. Like, you just leave that second part out. Right. Uh, you just say the good stuff. So, mm -hmm. so bias revelation, something we see everywhere. Questioning is why would that be the case? And in particular, why would it be the case given everybody knows that it's going on? We all know that social media is not where to get a complete picture of somebody's lives. We all know CNN and, and Fox News are also not the best places individually, at least, to see 
uh, what's going on in the world uh, of politics and so on and so forth. So everybody knows that this kind of spin is going on and yet it persists, why? That's the puzzle. So I'll give uh, two more forms of spin like that. The, the second one is bias search. So in addition to revealing evidence in a biased fashion, people also tend to search for it in a biased fashion. They tend to search really hard for the stuff that's supportive for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They go out of their way to get pictures for Instagram. They, um, the, the example we use in the book is a, of Dick Cheney and uh, the CIA in the lead up to the Iraq war, where he kept giving the direction, no, go find me evidence that weapons of mass destruction exist. And people will be like, but they don't. And be like, shut up or I'll fire you. Go find me evidence that they exist. And so he's clearly like not searching for evidence that they don't. He's cutting that search off and he's searching as hard as possible for any evidence that's consistent with this story. Um, and we tend, again, like as in the case of um, uh, bias revelation, we tend to do this outside of, of politics as well. And then the third example is that non-confirmatory non testing, which both of us tripped up, got tripped up uh, with. Confirmatory testing. Yes. Uh, sorry. I've, yeah, see, I got so tripped up, I didn't even notice I got tripped up. Uh, confirmatory testing. So with confirmatory testing, think about something like uh, the trick that climate uh, deniers do, where they... Uh, will ask you, they'll tell you, oh, no, the Earth actually isn't warming. If you look at uh, uh, the dates from 1989 to 2000 and whatever, then actually average temperatures fell. Mm -hmm. And that's true. It's a true fact. Mm -hmm. But like in a world with average temperatures that bounce around a little bit, the fact that you can find one date range such mm -hmm. that average temperatures falling is not a particularly hard test to pass. Mm -hmm. You would pass that test irrespective of whether the earth is warming or not. And that's the sense in which this is a confirmatory test. You're guaranteed to generate evidence that's supportive of your claim that the earth is not warming if the test you're running is, does a period exist? And regardless of whether your claim is true, so that, that's key to confirmatory tests, or, or another phrase we use for it is non-diagnostic tests. So it's the tests that are, are going to come out come out true regardless of whether the underlying hypothesis is true. And, and so, so like Eric said, whether or not the earth, earth is heating up or cooling, so long as it's variable, you can always come up with, with supportive evidence using this non-diagnostic test of just looking uh, being able to arbitrarily choose date ranges. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then another example that, that we often talk about is p-hacking. So, so mm -hmm. scientists, mm -hmm. scientists often, uh, uh, you know, uh, regardless of whether your hypothesis is true, if you can run enough statistical tests or like rerun your experiments enough times, you'll get roughly significant 20. <laughs> Say it again? Roughly yeah. 20. Mm -hmm. Right, roughly 20, exactly. So, so that's a way in which scientists run non-diagnostic tests and end up getting getting confirmatory evidence, regardless of, of whether their hypothesis is true, they'll be able to get significant uh, results. And again, the, the puzzle here too, with both of those other additional forms of spin is, we kind of know this is going on. We know that people are piacking. We know that um, people are cherry picking. We know that people are, are engaged in, in uh, bias search, and yet it persists anyway. And so yeah. uh, the question is, why does it do that? Well, why does it do that? <laughs> well, you want to you want to give this uh, explanation? Sure, I'll, 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 I'll try. Uh, um, you know, the basic idea is um, uh, uh, it's again a Nash equilibrium. So, so, and that's going to be the key answer to like everything. <laughs> Once you set things up with the right assumptions, right. you'll be able to explain these puzzles by by thinking about Nash equilibrium. Mm. So, the, the assumptions here are again, evidence has these properties that uh, you can freely transmit it. You can't fake it. Um, but you can withhold it. Hmm. And so, so let's first consider the, the type of setting where you just either have supportive or non-supportive evidence. And I'm trying to persuade you that something is true, like that I am I would make an attractive uh, date or, or a good person to hire, or that my political party is, is you know, on the right side of, of things. So I, I want to persuade you of things, and I have access to evidence, some of it supportive, some of it not. What would I choose to present to you? Claim, let's... If I present you only the supportive evidence and I leave out all the non-supportive evidence and you know, you anticipate that I'll do that, I can't benefit from deviating. Mm. It's a Nash equilibrium. Even if you anticipate it and you're you know, fully reasonable and adjust your interpretation of what I present to you uh, uh, um, accordingly, you'll know, oh, I'm only presenting to you the good stuff, I'm leaving out the bad stuff. 
And so you'll kind of discount what I present to you. It's still in my interest to keep doing that. Why? Well, suppose that I stop presenting you the good stuff. Well, you assume I would present to you all the good stuff. And so the fact that I don't present to you suggests to you that I don't have any good stuff. Okay, so I, I clearly don't want to deviate that way. I always want to present the good stuff to you. And now would I want to sometimes present to you the bad stuff? Well, well no, because, uh, you know, that won't help me, uh, like... Uh, all that's going to do is like tell you about the bad stuff that you otherwise wouldn't know about. And so, so again, I can't benefit by deviating by telling you the bad stuff. And there's a similar type of argument for, for bias search and, and not, uh, confirmatory testing. You know, again, if you expect me to be p-hacking, if I, if I run a real fear experiment um, and I'm not p-hacking, well, provided that it's, you can't tell that I'm not p-hacking, all you know is like the statistical results that I tell you. I'm not going to be doing myself any favors because you're, you're already assuming that I'm, I'm not doing the most fair test. And so if I, if I, you know, uh, I'm only hurting myself by, by, by doing things more fairly by running fewer regressions and stuff like that. So that's the basic idea is in all these cases, the way evidence is getting defined, the way evidence works, I'm optimally responding to your expectations. I'm optimally taking advantage of what's easy for you to verify and what, what's easy for you to observe. Uh, and like the best way to take advantage of that in persuasion settings is to is to spin in these particular ways. Yeah, so it's it's interesting, right? I mean, I, I don't want to use this example because I feel like it's a kind of a sidebar. But so if it is, you can tell me and, and we'll move on. But I feel like this happens with religion sometimes. People will choose to believe certain aspects of their religion and choose to not believe other aspects of other people. And they know what's going on. So, you know, if I say something like if someone, if, if I was a, a Christian and someone were to say, well, you know, slavery is in the Bible or, you know, um, you can't get divorced, you know, if, you know, someone's, you know, uh, beating their wife, you know, cause that's not allowed or, uh, et cetera. People will say, well, this and this and this and this, and there's always a reason out of it. Right. Um, and the, the argument with that would be, and this is why it might be too complicated as well you're operating on two different playing fields, right? With religion, it gets messy because you have this thing called like, you know, rationality, but then you also have this wonderful black box of, you know, faith and that we can never touch it, right? It's never, it never can, it doesn't play by the same rules as everything else in the world, right? It's always this whole kind of black box of like, well, that's why we, it, the things that are hard or things we can't do, we just put it in that box and we just say, okay, it's, we don't we talk about it. So I wonder, and the only reason I bring it up is because that's a very strong belief people will have and that will motivate people for doing <laughs> many good things, but also many terrible things as well. And so how, how do we, I mean, obviously we can see it with politics, we can see it with certain ideology, you know, but you know, religion is also another one of those where there's billions of people around the world that are going to be doing a lot of this confirmatory kind of testing, this bias revelation, you know, how, how does, how, how do we understand that of, is it just people in, in answering the kind of the why question? People know these things sometimes, right? Maybe deep down when they're by themselves, whether it's about religion or politics or a certain ideology, they know it's not perfect or they know it has issues or whatever. But is it a kind of all or nothing thing with many of these types of ways of thinking that if I if I if I if I take an L on this one thing where I acknowledge that this has an issue, then maybe the whole thing isn't right or something like that. Is that kind of what's going on, or what do you think is why this kind of still persists? Well, um, do you mind if I start off on this one? No, yeah, you're the one with the personal experience with it. <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 it was alluding to the fact that I was I was raised an Orthodox Jew. Mm. Um, but uh, regardless, I, I, um, I think there's a few interesting things to, to, to raise here. One of which is, we didn't talk about it yet, but we have a whole chapter on motivated reasoning. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. the, the idea there is that these forms of spin often get incorporated into our own beliefs. And I think that that's very relevant to, to your point, which is sometimes we kind of buy our own BS. Um, and uh, we end up we end up with very biased beliefs, biased in particular ways that are exactly consistent with the way we spin. So, so uh, you know, the psychological evidence suggests that like, I will be overconfident exactly to the extent that I um, can present supportive evidence and will totally ignore the non-supportive evidence. And, um, and you know, I'll run very non-diagnostic tests. And if the results end up good, uh, even though it wasn't a fair test, I'll still up my own personal internalized beliefs uh, uh, accordingly. Mm -hmm. So so you see our own internal psychology being affected in the same way that, that our, our spin is when we're trying to persuade others. And, um, you know, the basic, the basic premise is like, 
uh, it comes from Trivers and Ron Hippel, which is just, well, uh, uh, if you're trying to persuade others, it often helps if you buy your own BS. But the game theory helps you in figuring out what's the optimal type of BS to present to others, and hence the, the particular quirky ways in which we're going to end up being affected by motivated beliefs. So, so we will buy our own BS, but it'll have these same quirks as Ares, you know, described in his last um, uh, diatribe. Um, okay, so so now bringing that to, to religious beliefs and things like faith, um, you know, I do think oftentimes we'll buy our own BS, but as with other motivated beliefs, we're gonna we're gonna be somewhat constrained in like how much we are able to spin it, and and sometimes. You know, even if you're spinning, you still end up with nothing. And then you 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 kind of you might end up questioning things yourself and you might end up uh, having to rely on trump cards like, well, you know, it's not reasonable. Like God works in mysterious ways. You have to have faith. And sometimes those trump cards work, but sometimes people might start questioning it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that there's an interesting um, range in human psychology where where even though the evidence is rather, you know, biased, we'll still end up buying it. And that's that's the cases where I think, you know, where you can present very supportive evidence, even though it's cherry picked, or even though you, you've kind of ignored the, the negative stuff. So I don't know, one, one interesting example of this that comes to my mind, uh, I'm sure we can all come up with many, I mean, uh, um, uh, is during the Protestant uh, Reformation. There was this big, um, one big debate is what do you do with all of the um, relics? And, um, uh, you know, all of these old things that were like, uh, they kind of looked like uh, um, religious imagery, like images of Jesus and stuff like that. And, and you know, one of the big complaints was, well, this is like sacrilegious, this is like idolatry, this isn't allowed. And uh, some Protestant churches said, no, 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 that's fine. We can keep all our relics. We don't need to like break those or destroy those. And others, others like went on rampages and destroyed all these like uh, beautiful relics. And okay, how did the, each church play this kind of evidence game? And they, they found biblical quotes to support their own stance on relics. And interestingly, the same exact Ten Commandments were used by both sides. And so it turns out in the Old Testament, there's the Ten Commandments count differently depending on whether you're looking at uh, Exodus or Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. um, in one place, one of the 10 is don't have graven images. And in the other place, like that one is like only half a sentence and is merged with either the first or the third, I can't remember. And it's not given its whole number. And so, so depending on which of the, whether you're looking at Exodus or Deuteronomy, the 10 commandments either do or don't make, have like a whole explicit statement about like not having graven images. And if you're part of the church that wants to get rid of graven images, you, you use Exodus. And if you're part of the church that, that is fine with graven images, you use Deuteronomy. And so, you know, that's kind of like this classic example. And like, it turns out that's enough flexibility that each side could believe that they're doing exactly what the Bible says and, and you know, they can find evidence to support it. But like, yeah, it's it's kind of funny that uh, that people are able to, to be fooled this way. But I guess that's kind of the point. So long as you can present some supportive evidence um, and ignore the other stuff, like you can find one biblical quote, uh, one version of the Ten Commandments, then that, that turns out that's enough for us to be satisfied. And that's that's kind of a weird puzzling quirk of human psychology that we think these chapters help help us understand. Yeah, I mean, you can use the same thing in the gospel accounts as well, where you'll, you know, if you like whatever version you like, you know, you can find it in Matthew. But if you go over there to, to, to Mark or John, you know, then it's, it's it's completely different. It's not at all. It's partly there. And, you know, apologists for this will say, well, you know, it's different perspectives from the accounts that were happening. And that's fine. I mean, there, you can go that far with it. But at the certain point when there is legitimately different things or variants of, of the same story happening, Happening that are conflicting or contradictory, <clears throat> that becomes problematic. So <laughs> both the Old and New Testament do this quite often. Um, but it is interesting, though, about people definitely kind of starting to believe their own BS of sorts, right? You, you see this also in, in cults, right, where they start to really, quote, unquote, drink the Kool-Aid on, I mean, right? I mean, there's, <laughs> that comes from a particular cult, like it's a, it's a, it's an interesting way of how people will long term start to just kind of 
almost go over to the other side mentally where it's just like yes this is real or you know believe the whole the, the whole thing um i guess i want to skip forward real quick and, and just talk about the prisoner's dilemma if you feel it's relevant i mean you mentioned it it's, it's quite well known um how do you use that to understand individual self-interest and the collective and how does game f uh, theory fit in uh here and in, in, in the repeated prisoner's dilemma you do you want to start this time sure um <clears throat> the Prisoner's Dilemma is probably the, the most famous game in game theory. Um, uh, again, two players, they again have two actions that they can take either to cooperate or defect. Um, cooperation is somewhat costly to, to you, but benefits the other player. Um, and if the benefits are greater than the costs, uh, then it is socially optimal. Uh, mutually, uh, the, the thing that's best for both players is for both players to cooperate. Then they each get uh, something positive, but if uh, they both defect, they get nothing. And uh, however, from an individual player standpoint, if I don't uh, cooperate and the other player is cooperating, I get to save some money, I get to save some of these these resources. So I still get the benefits and I don't have to pay the costs. And if they're not cooperating, well, why would I pay the cost to benefit them? And so in both cases, I'm better off not cooperating. And so the Nash equilibrium of this uh, game is for neither player to uh, cooperate, which is a very simple way, basically, of characterizing social dilemmas, situations mm -hmm. where people can pay some sort of cost to benefit others or benefit society as a whole. And um, it is also a good way of, of showing that you don't always necessarily get the socially optimal outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, individual incentives and social incentives can kind of be at odds and you might not get the the uh, the best outcome. Now you alluded to the repeated prisoners dilemma, mm -hmm. and this is sort of where people started to to solve this problem. So they mm -hmm. they recognize, okay, there are these social dilemmas. How do we solve them? And uh, uh, a few folks came along in the seventies and I guess sixties and seventies, mm -hmm. and said, well, what happens if we repeat this game? What happens if we have this dilemma and then you know might interact again and play play the the game again and might interact again and play the game again and so on and so forth. And so mm -hmm. they they wrote down a game that's called the repeated prisoner's dilemma where they do a, the players do exactly that. Uh, they play a prisoner's dilemma with probability delta. They repeat with probability one minus delta, the game ends. And, and that happens every single round. That's called the, pris the repeated prisoner's dilemma. And now you can get cooperation. Basically what you need is two things. The strategies uh, that allow for cooperation have the feature and they are somewhat reciprocal, hmm. meaning if I'm going to be more likely to cooperate with you if you cooperated with me in the past, and less likely if you haven't. As long as uh, uh, strategies will have that, that will allow for cooperation. And then there's the second thing that you need, which is that future, the future has to be sufficiently important hmm. so that hmm. uh, I'm willing to forgo the costs now uh, hmm. in order to um, get the benefits from your future cooperation, from that uh, re reciprocal cooperation in the future. Uh, that parameter delta needs to be sufficiently high. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how people solve the game. And, and that's kind of the fundamental sorry, delta, building. I don't think you introduced delta. The probability of the uh, um, the game repeating. Yeah. Or um, we sometimes interpret that as the probability of your, your cooperative act being being observed. Um, right. But but the the that's kind of like the fundamental building block, uh, the, the starting point for understanding how people become cooperative and, and solve the dilemma. Uh, that's described by the the uh, single uh, the only uh, the the non-repeated prisoner's dilemma, mm -hmm. and it gets more complicated from there and and more interesting from there. Mm -hmm. um, well, um, okay. well, sorry, if you wanted to ask, no, no, I was no. just going to try and tie it into like what this teaches us about altruism, which is I was hoping where you were going. I was, was going to say I, altruism well, and punishment. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So what Eris just just explained is like. You know, Econ 101, you learn uh, the prisoner's dilemma and the repeated prisoner's dilemma. And the prisoner's dilemma is meant to help us understand the 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 puzzle of, uh, you know, why why are people cooperative in the first place? And like one key solution as well, if things are repeated, you can, you know, there, there could be some notion of reciprocity that sustains it. Fine. So that's, that's Econ 101. And I guess our main point, the main thing that we're trying to add here is, well, actually, if we think about our altruistic sentiments, if we think about what makes us feel good 
cooperating? Where, where, wh why do we have this sense of warm glow when we, when we give or when we do good deeds? When are we going to enjoy, have this kind of secondary reward of being altruistic? You can better understand that, that sense of altruism from thinking about it having been evolved or learned in the context of repeated settings. And, and you can understand the features of these of, of our altruistic sentiments, the quirky, strange aspects of it by thinking about um, the key features that sustain altruism uh, in uh, uh, the repeated game. So think about observability, think about uh, reciprocity. That will help us understand kind of uh, the what features our sense of altruism will have. And, and so we kind of we walk through a lot the the empirical evidence in the book of like when people feel more altruistic and what gets them to feel more altruistic and and being observed really matters a lot and so does things like plausible deniability so we talk a lot about the fact that like if you have some excuse for like not doing good that'll matter a lot too and and we, we argue of why that would also be important for sustaining cooperation in something like the repeated game um we we, we also explain how often does our altruistic sentiments I, I guess this goes back to trivers that our altruistic our sense of shame our sense of guilt is has built into that a sense of uh well whether or not we've been harmed by this person in the past whether or not this person has been good to us in this past so, so gratitude so e even our, our core emotions get shaped by this repeat again. And then I, I, I guess um, the, the other main thing that we add to this, well, two main things that we, we kind of add to like the original stories from, from Trivers and, and stuff is, well, the repeated game that it was described, it's very simplistic. And there are two kind of bells and whistles you could add to it. One is you could think about a community of interacting agents and, and start to talk about things like norm enforcement. Instead of just it, it, reciprocity between two people, you can talk about how norms get enforced among communities. And what more bite does that give you? Um, and then another thing that you can add is things like higher order beliefs, which is like, well, what if when you cooperate or defect, different people might have different information about, uh, about whether you cooperated or defected, and they might have information about what information others might have. What, what insights can that give us? And so we have several chapters kind of laying out, well, we can understand a lot about how norms work and a lot about how morality works by adding these bells and whistles. That it turns out that to sustain cooperation, it really doesn't just matter that I can tell whether you've defected, but whether I think errors thinks that you've defected. And so things like plausible deniability and common knowledge will come into play. And then, and then for, for this notion of like norm enforcement, the two key things that come into play are third party punishment. So I might, in equilibrium, I'm going to punish you for, for um, violating the norm. But importantly, in order to sustain a norm, you also need it to be the case that if I don't punish you for violating the norm, errors will punish me for, for failing to enforce the norm. And so this idea of higher order punishment, it turns out that and third party punishment suffice to, to, to sustain norms, provided you have, well, those are the two key features, but then we have these, these other chapters that talk about what property norms will need to have, like that they need to be categorical, they need to be observable and lack plausible deniability. That comes from the, the higher order belief stuff. Um, so those are the key insights that we add to the, that core model of prison Islam and repeated prison Islam. Yeah, so I have um, I have uh, one one bit here I want to ask you about, and then I have about uh, a few more, two or three more questions, and and then uh, I, I know you guys are are uh, are, are uh, very generous with your time, so I don't want to I don't want to push on that. I, I guess on on this here, I'll just land here for a minute. So. Um, my, uh, my friend, Nicola Rehani, she wrote the, the book, the social instinct, uh, it's a great book. Uh, she's a great researcher. Um, <clears throat> and we talked about this, uh, on, on the podcast and we talked about it uh, offline too, that there's this darker side of cooperation as well, though, right. That people can cooperate to do, uh, other things that are not so good, um, or, or, or cooperation could have negative benefits. Um, and in the book, I think you guys mentioned, I'm curious what your idea is, uh, two, two parts here. How do you see a difference between reciprocal altruism and cooperation or, you know, even some type of interdependence? Um, what, what are the differences there? And then also the idea of punishment, whether that's from a third party or a higher order, um, how, how is punishment, uh, imposing on cooperation, whether it's actual punishment or the threat of punishment. So how, how do you kind of just see uh, those, uh, those two things here? Why don't we start by answering that and then we can come to the second half of the question. And then, um, so, which is some of the antisocial stuff, which is we do talk a little bit in the book about how norms, uh, norms are, are often very good for the group of agents that are enforcing the norms, 
but very bad for outsiders. Mm -hmm. And so, so in particular, you see this, um, you know, whenever you have like a coalition of people that enforce in, enforce norms amongst themselves, which might hurt those outside of the coalition. So religions do this all the time. Religions have norms that are good for members of the religion, but bad for outsiders. So, so they say things like, well, we should help each other, but that could mean helping each other going to war with another religion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, you know, another example of this that we, we mentioned in the book is norms that help sustain um, segregation in the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you, you know, there were norms enforced through the same kind of logic that enforces norms against littering, you had norms that said, well, don't treat black people nice. And those norms said, if, if I caught you treating a black person nice, you yourself might be subject to, to punishment. And like white people did get lynched if they were too nice with black people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that sustained these segregation norms that kind of forced white people to help support this like racist society. Um, and that's uh, that's obviously, you know, when you consider humanity as a whole, that could be quite bad, even if it might have been, been good for the few white people who benefited from white supremacy. Um, and so, so you do get you do get that quite a bit um, uh, norm, norms that help in group members at the expense of out group members. Um, uh, so that, that that I think is uh, maybe answered the first half of your question, but but like there is. I wasn't so sure what you were saying with the second half, but maybe I'll take a little bit of a guess and you tell me if I misunderstood or, or yeah. Um, which is, we think of um, reciprocal altruism as like the repeated prisoner's dilemma as like one very stylized model of how you get cooperation off the ground. But it's, you know, there's a reason why it came out in the 60s. At, 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 you know, it was like the simplest model to write down, but it's not the only way to sustain cooperation. And, and like, there's kind of a richer set of models that can give you this. It kind of requires some of the features that Eris pointed out, like you need some notion of, of a shadow of the future and some ability for people to kind of condition their future actions and your current action. But that could happen in, in much more kind of complicated ways and doesn't just require reciprocity. It could, it could involve things like norm enforcement, as we discussed, or like, like punishment uh, um, as well. And so, so these are kind of other levers that you can use to sustain cooperation. And in the book, we talk about like the features they'll have in common with reciprocal altruism, but it, it's not quite as simplistic. You know, just like evidence games is, isn't quite as simplistic as costly signaling, but we would start off by presenting a simpler, more well-known model and then we kind of build off on it to gain additional insights. Yeah, I think my only question on the reciprocal altruism versus cooperation was basically, I think sometimes we'll see them as synonymous, right? That it's, yeah. oh, cooperation is just another type of, you know, reciprocity or it's another type of altruism. Yeah. Yeah. And so while there obviously uh, maybe some overlap, I do think that, that there are differences, you know, with yeah. cooperation having a larger suite of things that are incorporated, which would be interdependence, which I think is somewhat different than uh, just reciprocity. So that's what yeah. kind of the question was, was just kind okay. of how do you so, see those differences? I think I understand your question a bit better. Let me, let me try and respond a bit more. And if he has things to add, he can add. But um, I do think, for instance, I don't know. So we have norms against littering. And uh, uh, that's a norm where, you know, if, if you catch me littering, you might be like, dude, but why, like pick that up. And like, you know, that's got, and like, I might anticipate that and not litter. I might even internalize it and think littering is bad. Um, but that's got nothing to do with reciprocity. It's not like I'm, I, the reason why I'm not littering is because that'll prevent you from littering. Like, you know, no, it's, it's, it's more that I, I don't want to get punished for littering. And like, I've internalized that. And so, so, you know, that's kind of a ritual model of norm enforcement. That it, it's not really about reciprocity. And I, I think there are other examples of like, cooperation you know they're um, cooperating to keep the environment clean the other ways that you can cooperate that again don't require reciprocity reciprocity is just kind of one way to get um uh, uh you scratch my back i scratch your back that's just one way to sustain cooperation mm -hmm. there are many other ways right. and each of these different kind of models for understanding cooperation might have relevance for different settings and might, might give you different insights about how cooperation will work and what your future has so one that uh nicola talks a lot about and provides some nice evidence for it is that sometimes we cooperate to signal uh, underlying traits about ourselves, kind of like like the cost of signaling model. So, so I might, for instance, um, be be nice to animals, 
partly because I want to signal that I'm an empathetic person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not that I, I think, uh, you know, I'm going to be vegetarian because I don't want cows to eat me. Like, no, there's no reciprocity between me and cows, but it's because I want you to know that I feel empathy. And maybe if I feel empathy to, to cows, that'll suggest something to you about how I might treat my friends um, um, and, and it may, might make you more willing to become friends with me. And so, so that notion of like cooperation as a signal of an underlying trait like empathy is another way that you might be able to sustain cooperation cooperative behaviors. Um, and that, that'll show up in different contexts uh, uh, than reciprocity will, and, and might have different features than reciprocity will have. Ares, mm -hmm. uh, you wanted to jump in here on that? No, actually, I think, um, I think that uh, is a fairly complete answer. Basically, mm -hmm. to summarize, there are multiple ways we get cooperation. Right. Uh, we in our book focus uh, on uh, norms a lot and uh, build up to it using the repeated PD. And uh, those are those are two ways you get cooperation. But uh, Nicola has covered some other ways, and, and mm -hmm. as Mo said, they will uh, yield somewhat different uh, uh, behaviors in different contexts. Mm. I guess uh, kind of uh, just off of that, you mentioned a, a little bit in the book, uh, sort of towards the end about trust and how trust can be a key component when considering intentions. Um, so how much do we understand how much trust is important there? And for first and second order beliefs, so what's the how is trust a key ingredient ingredient for some of these ways of, you know, understanding how we're cooperating or not or, or, or things like that? You want to talk about principles, or do you have something else that you're going to jump in with? Um, I'm going to start by saying that uh, trust is, is probably particularly important in context with some variation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I see you do something, but what trust is about is, do I believe that you would do it again in another case? Will, mm -hmm. will you be cooperative in another context that might not be exactly what I just observed in this one? Um, and there are various ways that that one might build trust and that that might uh, end up shaping our taste, beliefs, intuitions that we think are important. So for instance, Mo is alluding to this idea of principles. Um, one way that one can become more trusted is to, instead of making decisions by doing a very careful, conscious uh, um, calculation of costs and benefits, mm -hmm. instead have a higher principle that one uh, uses to guide one, mm -hmm. one's decision-making, which then might make one more trustworthy if one follows that principle, even in cases where it might not benefit you, but it does benefit the other people around you. Mm -hmm. So it didn't. It didn't actually make it into this uh, draft of the book. But but in our class, we usually teach a few modules on principal behavior, and, and we have a few papers on the topic too. And hopefully, in the next edition of the book, it'll make it in. But nice. uh, we, we do think a, a key to understanding principal behavior is to think about how trust works. And there's some some insights that game theory can can give on that that it was what we're, we're alluding to. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, try, um, principles are are, are going to be a way to to, to suggest to others that you're going to you're going to act act cooperatively not just in this context but in other contexts where you might be more tempted to deviate um and uh you know the, the, uh, that's the key insight Yes, it's very it's very interesting how again trust is a thing that people talk a lot about, but it's a it's a very interesting way to kind of try to drill down what it is, how how does it stay constant oh, yeah. or how does it change? What is a trustworthy person? It, it seems like a very amorphous kind of <laughs> concept, but that we all kind of know. But it's a, I think it's super super important. Maybe it's just very very deeply rooted. And no, and, but in general, like a lot of the things that we've been talking about today, kind of have that feature, like the word mm -hmm. cooperation. It means yeah. something really specific to, to somebody who is talking about the prisoner's dilemma. Mm -hmm. But to in English, it means something a little bit broader. Mm -hmm. Trust also probably means a few things at once. And then if we were going to sit down and model it, then we're probably going to drill down, choose one aspect mm -hmm. of trust, focus on that aspect, and see what we can learn with a little bit of, of simple modeling, and then you know go back out and say, okay, what else is there about trust that we need to learn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, last question here. Um, how can people use uh, game theory or use the things that they've learned from the book uh, to understand many aspects of uh, human behavior and pro-social cooperation and many other things? Well, another way of asking that is, you know, what is the, 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 the key, you know, takeaways, I guess, that you want people to have from the book that they can say, hey, this is important, not just for economics, but it can also be important for pro-social behaviors or behavior in general. What are the things that you pe people to want people to grasp from the book? My, my sense is that um, 
the 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 approach that we present in the book and the, the book itself really kind of teaches like a handful of tools and, and a perspective. So the perspective is kind of try to look at the world in terms of uh, primary rewards, in terms of like these kind of um, evolved things that, that, that we like that might shape other secondary rewards. And it gives you, I think, a lot of clarity on what those costs and benefits might be, what those rewards might be, and how they might then be able to shape all sorts of other things that vary between people, like our passions, our principles, our cooperativeness, uh, the things we signal, uh, you know, our sense of aesthetics, uh, the way we spend stuff like that. And, and so just kind of gives you a, a sense of what kinds of things might matter, might, might be able to explain those otherwise puzzling behaviors. And then, so it's that lens mixed in with like a handful of like specific models and those specific models like costly signaling, like evidence games, like, like buried signals, um, like the repeated prison of the Norman, norm enforcement, higher order beliefs. Like it, the book has like, I don't know, 15 of these models. Each model kind of clarifies in a specific setting, here are some important like factors to consider and implications that those factors will have. And, and I think that like Eris just mentioned with this last answer, they'll give you a little bit of clarity on what we mean by trust. What you know, they'll help you kind of characterize what what exactly is spin. You know, here are some ways spin works. Here are some assumptions you need. You know, that will tell you the context in which spin is going to be particularly pre prevalent. You know, it'll kind of give you some clarity on that and 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 help you understand some of the puzzling features of spin, but also just help you kind of see the world a little bit more clear. I, I think that's the main thing the book does. Mm -hmm. But but I think. It does maybe one more thing, which in some cases it gives you some valuable prescriptions on how to combat spin or how to get people to be more cooperative. And Ayers in particular has has focused a lot of his his uh, research out, outside of the book and the class that we teach together on using these kind of models to help get people to, to say be more cooperative. And so mm -hmm. it, 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 we talk a little bit about it in our chapter on altruism. We, we have like one box or whatever where we allude to some of this stuff. But if you look at his website or if you Google his name, you'll, you'll see he's got a TED talk that kind of summarizes a lot of this work. And he's got, you know, a handful of, of cool field experiments where, where he, he, he went out and got companies or, or, or NGOs to, to use some of these um, uh, theories to actually get people to be more pro-social in, in, in effective ways. And um, uh, that's another thing that I think these models help with. So, so one, it explains puzzles, helps give us some clarity on, on, on what's going on. And, and two, sometimes gives you valuable valuable prescriptions like, like what he's been focusing on in his... Harris, yeah. um, anything that you would want to say about uh, kind of the biggest things you want people to take from the book and, and maybe any applied ways that you would want them to, to use many of the things discussed? I, I'm with Mo on this. The, the book is a, a way of trying to uncover people's hidden motives. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, a perspective that's helpful for that. And that's sometimes just interesting and helpful for understanding the world. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, if you understand how, how what's motivating people better, then you're probably better at changing their behavior in, in some contexts. One of those contexts is in promoting pro-social behavior where we've done a fair amount of work. Another one might be if you're trying to craft a um, a news environment that's got less fake news and misinformation and more more mm -hmm. uh, is more informative in general and, and so on and so forth. And so um, we hope that it's uh, a book that will interest people who are interested in understanding the world. And, and uh, there's work to be done in terms of using this to make the world a better place. And uh, But perhaps it's a good place to start. Yeah, no, that's 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 great. The book is called Hidden Games, The Surprising Power of Game Theory to Explain Irrational Human Behavior. Uh, it's out now everywhere. Uh, and I have to say, uh, prob and I'm not just saying this because you, you guys are in front of me, uh, it, probably one of the best books I've read this year. Uh, honestly, it is, it is a, it's quite a, a, so. a, a great book. Um, very accessible, really good content, a lot of novel things in there. Um, so it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Where can people find uh, both you guys and the work you're doing and all the relevant places? Twitter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Mo is Moshe underscore Hoffman. Uh, and I am Erez Ueli no underscore. So we just want to mix it up for you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, those are our uh, handles on Twitter. And it was just right that we're pretty interactive on Twitter. So feel free to find us there and message us if you have thoughts about the, this podcast. 
Um, uh, we also have websites. So if you Google our names, you'll you'll find all of our all of our you know our research papers. Um, the book you can find on on Amazon. It's probably the easiest place, but it, it's all you know on Audible and on Kindle and, and stuff like that too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I'm big thanks to both you guys for 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 coming on and giving your time and your energy and all of your wonderful insights. This was a, a blast of a conversation. I enjoyed every minute of it, and I I can't say yeah, enough thanks to both of you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right.